Here in The Hague, Europe's law enforcement agency Europol is under the spotlight after repeated terrorist attacks last year, culminating in the Christmas massacre at Berlin's market. The organization's boss is Rob Wainwright, who says lessons have been learned. But which ones, and is Europe safer as a result? Rob Wainwright, welcome to Conflict Zone. Thank you. When we look at the recent attacks, particularly the Berlin massacre, the Christmas market, um, you had said previously that lessons had been learned from other attacks. If those lessons had been learned, how was Anis Amri, a man who was well known to intelligence police agencies, how was he able to get away with what he did? Well, I think that one of the lessons was that we were facing this incredible heightened security threat, which we still have. And of course, Berlin, unfortunately, is a sad reminder of that, that we're dealing with thousands of potential highly radicalized individuals who could carry out those kind of attacks. But this was a man who'd been under surveillance for most of the year by Germany's intelligence agency. His phone had been monitored. He was heard offering his services as a, as a martyr. Moroccan intelligence had twice told Germany that he was shopping for weapons and America put him on a watch list. Yes. So he did everything except put an ad in the paper and announce what he was going to do. Didn't well, of course, it's for the, and, and in order to avoid your question, Tim, but it's for the German security authorities to answer directly what, what they did in that case. What I can say across Europe, though, is that we are dealing with a pool, a very large community of people, some of, many of which are, are, are surveilled, many of which are on the radar of law enforcement, but it's a very large community and it's not always easy to predict who who the next attack might come from. But this from. man was volunteering to be a martyr. He was heard volunteering his services. If you can't stop a man like that, who can you stop? Well, you have to ask the German uh, intelligence authorities that, that question. But you're responsible, your agency is responsible for facilitating the rapid exchange of criminal intelligence and security information between EU states. Yes, and there's been a five-fold increase in that in the last year, and that has led to many uh, successes in, in, in fighting terrorism, many of which of course are not publicized. Unfortunately, because we're facing an almost unprecedented threat, we cannot reduce that threat to zero. Certainly not in, 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 a, in, in a country, in a, in a region where we choose to live our lives in an open but and free way. But this was a threat that advertised itself, you have to admit. I mean, well, it advertised itself to a number of police agencies. I mean, you, you're putting the finger on German intelligence here, but I mean, the Americans and Moroccans, lots of people knew about him. Well, I and think he, he was able to travel a thousand miles across three European countries until he pulled a gun on an Italian policeman and they shot him. Yes, he was able to travel at a time when, first of all, he wasn't identified as the main suspect. It took a while, of course, for the German investigators to identify him. He then travelled across what is, of course, a borderless uh, Schengen zone before he was apprehended finally by the Italian authorities. Now, this is a, a sad case and every every terrorist attack that is successfully carried out is, is a very sad case, of course, but most of them in Europe today are stopped, are prevented through very good police and intelligence work. But it was the same failure of communication with one of the Brussels bombers, wasn't it? Eight, eight months before Ibrahim el Bakrawi blew up Brussels airport, he was arrested in Turkey, the Turks informed Belgium, Belgium promptly lost the information and didn't pass it on. There are many reasons why we have to still improve the way in which we um, collect and exchange intelligence right across Europe. We've been saying this for years. We've been saying this for years. Because Same message a, and it isn't getting through. It so is getting better of course, a five-fold increase in the amount of intelligence. The number of attacks that I've seen thwarted across Europe represent a large degree of success. Not everyone, not every, every attack sadly has been prevented. That doesn't mean that security cooperation in Europe is not working at all. Of course not. This is a very significant problem, as most authorities see, as we've seen sadly now in Turkey as well. There's a, this terrible attack in Istanbul on New Year's Eve, where it's taken at least a week for the security authorities in Turkey, who are very resourceful, very capable, still to identify him. It's the nature, I'm afraid, of this very diffuse, difficult um, a, a terrorist threat for us to counter. I understand, but these were key intelligence failures, weren't they? Never mind what else is going on. These should have been stopped. I think in these, these in particular these, instances in these cases, should have been more stopped. Should, should have been done to exchange the intelligence, uh, to use the instruments of security cooperation that we have established in Europe. More should have been done to use those systems in those cases. So the public could be forgiven for saying that a lousy job was done. 
on these, in these two cases. Well, the, pu the public should have confidence that most terrorist attacks are stopped in Europe. But how can they have, have confidence when we look at the number of terrorist attacks that have taken place in Europe over the last 12 months, well, which haven't been stopped? Well, of course, every terrorist attack is, is, is a tragedy, is a human tragedy in Europe. But they should recognise that we cannot reduce the threat to zero. I think most, most parts of the public would understand that in, in the face of what they're obviously seeing around the world and the way in which we are dealing with thousands of radicalised people and a very determined and well-resourced terrorist group in ISIS that are intent on carrying the fight into our back door in Europe, as we've seen from Paris through Brussels and now in Berlin as well. And pretty good at exploiting Europe's weaknesses. Well, they do their best, but, but they... Well, they haven't uh, done badly, have they? Well, they've, they've, I mean, they've scored some, some key success, what, what, what they would regard as key successes. They've carried they? out some spectacular attacks in Europe. Yes, they have. Spectacularly successful attacks. Absolutely. If you look at Paris, it was a game changer for our community and represented a significant uh, challenge laid down to us to improve our game. No doubt about that. I'm the first person to admit that. So with the intelligence failures, how was it that before the referendum on Brexit uh, in the UK, how was it that you were telling the UK public that they would be so much better off inside the EU and shouldn't be voting for Brexit? You said that Brexit had the potential to harm the UK's ability to fight terrorism and crime. There'd be a negative impact, you said. Britain would not have the influence in your organisation that they did uh, do at the moment. That's not true, is it? Well, most of that, all of that, in fact, is true in the sense that exactly what you've been describing is, is the uh, reaction from a heightened terrorist attack about... Uh, what, what's implicit in your question is that there should be better security cooperation and indeed therefore that means that our community has to be even more closely integrated. What well, I was saying before Brexit that is that if Britain leaves the EU there are possible consequences for over how the mechanics of that would mean about Britain being as closely as possible connected with this EU But Britain is 40% of everything that Europol does is linked to work that is either provided or requested by the UK. Absolutely. So and, that's and not going to change, is it? Well, it's subject to the negotiations. You know as well as I do, but we cannot predict what the, the negotiations around Brexit will, have, will eventually transpire. And that's exactly what I said before uh, the, the, the vote on the referendum. I hope and indeed perhaps expect, yes, that Britain will get a good deal on security, but it's not for me to second guess what that might be. Britain... Well, Europe has more to lose than Britain. If, if there's any kind of separation, That's a political doesn't judgment. it? political You should perhaps ask political people on both sides of the negotiation well, that are about to uh, take Richard place. Richard Dearlove, the former head of MI6, said Britain is Europe's leader in intelligence and security matters. You ought to know. You worked for MI5 and gives much more than it gets in return. Yeah, Richard retired about 13 years ago and much has happened and well, changed he hasn't, since he hasn't, then. He hasn't lost contact. I don't know. I don't, I, I, I've lost contact with him, so I wouldn't know. My point is that, that so of he's course, a person Britain who is, has considerable Britain experience is a leading in these player, matters. of course, in the EU on security matters. And the I hope leading it player, and I hope it continues to be um, after, after Britain leaves the European Union. The terms in which it will continue to be a leading player and how it will contribute is exactly down to political negotiation that will not involve me. When we look at whether Britain is part of Europol, it's going to be part of Europol, isn't it? I hope and, so. Well, I mean, there's no doubt about that. You're not going to cut off your nose to spite your face. Simply. Well, it's not down to me, but I hope simply so. Simply because I hope Britain so, of, leaves of the EU. The EU what I'm is very not pleased about is that the Prime Minister, face. Theresa May, has recently decided that for the time being it will remain a member of Europol when we change our legal framework this year. So it will continue to be a member of a revitalised, a renewed Europol from May this year. Beyond that and that time at which they leave the EU is down to the negotiations. I hope it will continue to be a member. I expect it will be, but it's not down to me. Richard Walton, who was head of counter-terrorism command at New Scotland Yard until 2015, says the major problem at the moment here in Europe is porous borders, free movement of firearms, limited police engagement with minority communities and little joined up intelligence. Not a great accolade for Europol, is it? Well, not from whoever it was that said that. Richard but, Walton. Okay. But, but I, Former what, head of counter-terrorism command at New Scotland. Well, what I hear from uh, police chiefs right around Europe and from ministers that, uh, whose meetings I attend very often is a different picture, actually. It's one in which we are united in our resolve against an unprecedented terrorist threat, but one in which we're seeing huge improvements in the level of police cooperation, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in our ability, collective ability to track the flows of illegal firearms, terrorist finance, in our ability by establishing a brand new European unit here at Europol to monitor the extent to which ISIS is abusing the internet with this ugly propaganda. But you're hobbled by Schengen, We supported you? 80 operations last year. So there's been 
the new European Counterterrorism Centre has, has quadrupled, more than that actually, a five-fold increase in the amount of intelligence that we're sharing. I understand. From that we supported 80 operations last year. I understand, year. Rob Wainwright, but Schengen hobbles you. Free movement hobbles you. You cannot have free movement in the era of terrorism when you're facing, as you say, an unprecedented terrorist threat. Well, of course, Schengen, Schengen has been suspended by six countries so far. Um, former president of France, Nicolas Sarkozy, said Schengen's dead. He's already pronounced it dead. You can't keep this as one of Europe's sacred cows in the ear of terrorism, can you? Well, again, that, that's, that's... It's got a, to go. That's, that's, that's something that politicians on behalf of the But don't you have an public, opinion on this? I have an opinion, which well, is... I'd, I'd, lo I'd love to hear it. Well, first of all, I respect the fact that the most recent European surveys show that 81% of European citizens still want freedom of movement in Europe. And that reflects the fact for over 30 years this has been a very, very significant benefit for millions of citizens every day. But most of these citizens are not experts in, in counter-terrorism and policing, which you no, apparently are. So, so, I, so I'm asking, so we I'm, I'm, I'm ask, well, I will come on to that in a minute, but I'm, I'm asking you about your opinion on this, on Schengen. Well, my opinion is that it, it is a significant benefit that needs to be protected. All right? It's a, it's a significant course, weakness at the same time, of isn't course, it? It's, it's an instrument of freedom that is enjoyed by our citizens, but of course capable of being exploited by criminals and, and terrorists. And is being exploited, and is, isn't it? Of course it, it is. In the same so way, however... So it should be suspended, let me, shouldn't let me it? give you a, another analogy. You're not going to answer in this, this question, are in you? In the same way as another instrument of freedom, such as the internet, is exploited every day by criminals and terrorists. By the way, the internet is by far a more significant facilitator of crime and terrorism than the Schengen borderless zone will ever be. Ron no Noble, one the talk, former head of no Interpol. No one talks about abandoning the internet. Ron, Ron Noble, former head of Interpol, said it was, Schengen was like hanging out a welcome sign for terrorists. Yeah, I saw right, that view. I, 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 right, I respect Ron Noble's view, yes. I respect his And you view. agree with it? No, I don't agree with him because it's our job in law enforcement not to whinge about political decisions that are made, but actually are not to take take the benefits and freedoms away from our public, our job in the law enforcement security world is to protect those benefits by redoubling our efforts and making use, by the way, of, of the security measures the Schengen Agreement brought in as well. This was as much about bringing in a new era of closer police cooperation as it was about abolishing internal border control. Why isn't it your role to tell the politicians, as a professional, a policing and intelligence professional, that this is no longer possible. Schengen is no longer possible and it's causing a, a big problem in terms of security for Europe. I don't, believe it, I, I, I don't believe in that view. I'm not going to tell politicians that. What I will be telling them is that we have to make greater use of these very security measures the Schengen zone brought in, in, into place. The Schengen information system, which we don't hear enough about, the largest security database in Europe, 64 million alerts every day circulating, on unwanted persons, missing persons, stolen vehicles, for example, checked three billion times last year, Tim. Three billion times by law enforcement officers right around Europe. This is, you know, as a compensating feature for the fact that we've abolished internal border controls. It's not a small solution. But, you, but you, have a, you have a problem of trust between member states, don't you? And, and there could be much more sharing of information. We had France's former intelligence chief under President Sarkozy, Bernard Squassini, said in April last year, with East European countries as EU members, no one wants to share details on sensitive operations. It's a question of trust. So you can't get past this question of trust, can you? I think trust is very important in the counter-terrorist world. Yeah, but it's You're not absolutely happening. Right. All these calls for better intelligence sharing, if there's no trust, they're not going to happen, are they? Well, I've seen a five-fold increase at Europol in the last year. I've also seen how the intelligence community outside the, the framework of the EU have established for the first time uh, uh, a, a central European database to share their intelligence. I see a lot of intelligence sharing. But there member states will not make a legal commitment, will they, to share? Well, they will not. No, but I'm not sure they need that, to be honest. They, you know, in, in this world... Well, your chief of staff, Brian Donald, in 2015, was lamenting that fact. He said, obligation is a word that's lacking in EU law enforcement cooperation. Member states don't like it and don't like to be obliged to do anything with anybody, least of all Europol. Well, absolutely. And, and so we have that's to... That's a pretty poor state of affairs. Well, no, because legal obligations... EU states don't like to be obliged to do anything with anybody, least of all Europol. Because what an indictment in, of the organisation that you run. They don't want anything to do with it. You're toxic as far as they're concerned. Well, that's your words, not anyone else. They, they, they have to be convinced in their hearts and minds that, that we, we can support the work that they're doing. And they're not. If I give them a legal obligation 
that's not going to convince the, these, these hoary old investigators to do what they really need to. I need to convince them that we can really support their, their investigations, as we have Europe done in, needs better in 80 than hoary old investigators, in the last year. doesn't it? Europe needs better than a bunch of hoary old investigators. And that's why, you know, as, 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 uh, you know, in return to the trust that they've given us, they have given us five times as much more intelligence this year than the year before. So I think, I think that the trust factor is, is, is very, very important. And if there we was more trust, this yet, it but it's obviously increasing. If there was more trust, it wouldn't have taken you so long to get this airline passenger database, which isn't even up and running now. But we've had some six years since the Commission proposed it, maybe another two years before it's mandatory. This is a vital system for the safety of passengers. And the EU just kicked it around for years. And have now signed it alongside... Well, they've signed it, but it wasn't, isn't going to come into effect for two years, Alongside a new is it? firearms directive, a new terrorist financing directive, but alongside it isn't coming a new into effect travel authorization for two system. Years. And I could continue, Tim. But the why amount waste of, six years Because that's the this. nature of the why democratic process in, in, in Europe. We're not a, a federal United States of Europe, as we all know, not least from the Brexit debate. And so this is how the constitutional well, democratic you, processes work. Have you failed to work. inject any urgency into this debate whatsoever to get them off their backsides and producing this kind of agreement that's going to help save lives we created, and protect passengers We created for the first time in Europe a European counterterrorism centre at Europol within six weeks of the attack in, in, in Brussels. We, we, we responded to the attack in Berlin already by by, by uh, uh, up upgrading the firearms directive, for example, of course there's a sense of urgency and sometimes that kicks in. But at the same time we're dealing with uh, an institutional architecture that of course is complex across 28 member states. And let me tell you, the level of cross-border police intelligence cooperation in Europe is by far the most advanced of any region in the world. So sometimes well, we should be grateful much, and it? we should... That's we not should saying much in many regions, is it? Let's be honest, that's not saying much. It's still the best in the world, Tim. And, and we should, we should in, in this case, actually recognise the merits of that and, of course, improve it At still further. At the same further, time as your chief of staff is saying that nobody wants to deal with you in, in, in terms of making obligations on, on cooperation and sharing of intelligence information. Well, well, that's quite an indictment, isn't it? I don't it? think he, he said it uh, like Well, I gave that, you the exact honest. words that he did say. Yes, and what he said, and of course it is true, is that we, we, we should not need to rely on legal obligations. We have to convince these people to invest more by sharing intelligence in the European system so that we can help them to stop more and more terrorist attacks. Rob Wainwright, one of your central pledges is that you respect and take enormous trouble to maintain the secrecy of confidential documents. But there are huge concerns about the bulk data transfer from the SWIFT Bank telecommunications service based in Belgium to the US, um, which you are supposed to monitor. You are supposed to make sure that the US requests comply with the terms of an agreement that is secret. Why should it, this agreement be secret? Because we're dealing with methods and intelligence which are shared by the American authorities with Europol in order to justify, of course, uh, the, these measures that have to be protected. They are, they but are you don't even nature. know what material is being sent to them, do you? Yes, I, I, we, we, we do know that, of course. Under you don't know how much? You don't know how much material is being sent, do you? The Americans every month have to duly authorise each request through Europol, which is scrutinised independently by us, and the justification the Americans shared with us is, is in considerable detail each, each month with operational information if necessary to support their case. In 2012, that absolutely is secret material that needs to be protected. In 2012, the Information Commissioner said, in line with the provisions of this agreement, Europol does not see or manage the SWIFT data or know the amount of data actually transferred. No information has been released by the US regarding the amount of data transferred. You don't even know what you, what's well, being said. Well, I mean, that, 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 that statement four years ago, I think, was uh, unfair, actually. But we accepted it nonetheless and have improved and tightened the system since, since then, over four years ago. And over that period, I think there have been considerable improvements. And that same commissioner body, our data protection bodies, most latest assessment is much more positive. What is disturbing is that the European Ombudsman, who tried to investigate this deal with the US, you twice turned down requests from MEPs and the European Ombudsman for information on this terrorist financing program. These are the people who are supposed to supervise what you do. No, the people who supervise the authorities, the Independent Data Protection Authority, who have full access to everything in our files, and they've had that. 
The Ombudsman is something else, of course, and in that, in that sense was asking to make public some information that we couldn't do because we had to follow our security regulations, which, by the way, are necessarily robust in order for us to continue to have the kind of trust that we were talking about is necessary to build that, up confidence she didn't see it in that the counter terrorist world. With respect, she didn't. With respect, she, she didn't. said this reflected a democratic deficit at the level of the EU, which must be addressed. So you, she's a serious player, and this is a serious charge. This is a serious charge. Of isn't course, it? I respected it. I also respect the um, legal obligation that I have to maintain my security regulations. A legal obligation which you can't make public. We don't oh, know I, what we I, don't know what the deal no, is. The, I, I, the public I, in Europe do not know what this deal is, nor do they, they know do. what the modalities of this deal are. Do absolutely, they? they do because we explain the modalities. They are public knowledge. They've been published. The modalities. What, what. What is not made public, obviously, is the secret intelligence that justifies the monthly requests, for good reason. So the idea then that people in Europe can find out what information is being held or transferred about them is simply not true, is it? No, they cannot. Well, in, in that case, no. In that case, we are, let me make very clear, Tim. We are not making public the intelligence that the United States is relying on with its European partners to identify and apprehend terrorist activity across the world, including Europe. We are not making that pu public, and I think most people would understand the reasons for that. Your website says the European Ombudsman checks complaints about maladministration in EU institutions and bodies. How can the Ombudsman possibly do that when you deny her the documents they need to do their job? Well, we explained to the Ombudsman in that case. In the end, well, I she didn't agree. We explained also to the Parliament, actually, in that case, and, and the majority of members of, of the Responsible Committee have accepted that, that explanation. In that particular case, it was very important for me, not to break the law, actually, to follow the security legal framework that, that, that is in place above Europol in order exactly to maintain the trust that I need to rely on to ensure effective intelligence. But it's the sharing. Americans who are in control here. The Americans are in control of this document, that's coming, these documents that are coming out of Europe and being transferred every single day to the Treasury Department in the United States. Every month States. they have to justify that request. Any of those months, Europol can stop that. And have stop you the ever flow turned from... down a US request? No. Exactly. So you have essentially we no, have delayed you, the you, request you have on, essentially on no control whatsoever, or you're choosing well, not, not you, to exercise. You know that, that's a, you're you're that's choosing not to exercise any control. Your judgment. You're we, choosing not to exercise any we, control. We have delayed the request many times um, until they further justified the response, but actually. Um, we have established an excellent co cooperation with the U.S. authorities. They, they have improved the extent to which they have to pr provide the evidence, and we've been satisfied with that. Rob Wainwright, you're accused of failing to tell the bodies that are supposed to supervise you about a serious security breach which was revealed two months ago in November. A Dutch television program said it found more than 700 pages from confidential dossiers, including names and telephone numbers of hundreds of people associated with terrorism, albeit going back some 10 years. Doesn't inspire confidence in your procedures that these documents got lost? Oh, that was an embarrassing episode. Of course it was. Uh, thankfully, it was uh, about data 10 years ago, none of which compromises any current investigation, but we didn't take it lightly. You didn't um, inform Parliament we, about this well, our first during a joint meeting of the European Parliament and the national parliaments in December, you didn't. Well, for my first duty was, you to, was to inform our operational Parliament. partners to make sure that we weren't compromising any, any, any data. The extent to which I couldn't inform Parliament at that time again reflects the fact that the investigations into that case was ongoing and couldn't be made public at the time. Um, I'm waiting, by the way, for the European Parliament to establish a necessary intelligence subcommittee, perhaps, in which I can give classified briefings uh, that, uh, of the type that you might see in national parliaments. I hope that will happen soon, because I, I trust the, the close relationship that Europol has with the Parliament. But in that case, once again, I had to protect the, the extent to which uh, ongoing investigations. Well, it didn't satisfy place. some of the MEPs, did it? The Dutch MEP Sophie in Advelt called the revelation extremely shocking. She said Europol was aware of this security incident since last September, yet its director decided not to inform Parliament during a joint meeting of the European Parliament and the national parliaments on European scrutiny. So it was a question of, of not coming clean. The, the EU Security Commissioner, Julian King, felt it necessary to remind you that you still need to be seen as legitimate, implying that you're not well, yet of course, seen um, as legitimate. Uh, no, it didn't satisfy uh, one or two MEPs. That's true, and that's what I expect, of course, in, in any democratic debate. It doesn't worry you, though. 
Of course it, it concerns me, but I was also reassured by many, many, many more MEPs uh, who made reassuring uh, uh, noises about how Europol handled it once it was discussed in the plenary session a few days after that. How many other secret agreements are there with the Americans that we know nothing about? We have no secret agreements with the Americans at all. Absolutely none? No secret hand agreements. Hand on heart? Hand on heart, hand on Bible, whatever, hand you want, whatever you want me to place the hand on. We have no secret agreements with the United States of America or indeed any other country around the world. Rob Wainwright, good to have you on Conflict Zone. Thanks very much.